Hard to believe that 2018 is heading out the door. We are standing on the edge of that cliff, that precipice, as we look out toward 2019, and we wonder what all will 2019 hold for us. 2018 was a big year. Lots of things happened throughout the country, but also throughout our church and throughout our families. And so 2018 is going, but 2019 is coming. And so I was thinking about those just meditating on the fact that we are moving into a brand new year. Just in a couple of days, the words of the prophet Jeremiah came to mind as he wrote in Lamentations chapter 3. He said, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. He says, because his passions, his compassions fail not. And then he says this in 3.23, for his mercies, they are new every morning. He says, great is your faithfulness. And then in 24, he says, The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in Him. The Lord is good to those who wait for Him, to the soul who seeks Him. And so no matter what 2019 holds, we can reflect back and we can take hope and solace in this Lamentations chapter 3 that His mercies, His compassions are new every morning and great is His faithfulness. Yes. So this. Jeremiah said, Yahweh, the Lord is my portion, and I hope in Him. And so this week, though, guys, we're coming to the end of our journey through Paul's epistle to the Galatian churches. We had stepped away for a few weeks, but now we're coming back to it to finish this out. The churches in Galatia, if you remember, they had come under attack from the Judaizers, who they had sought to undermine Paul's teachings and the gospel message of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. And we talked about the five solas of the Reformation. And today we also add sola scriptura, which is according to the scriptures alone. In other words, this is our authority. This is where we get all wisdom and all knowledge is from the scriptures. We don't seek that outside of it. There is no authority above scripture. Scripture is the ultimate authority. And so it's by scripture alone. No doubt some in the church had recognized the heresies which had bewitched many of the congregations. Many of the people were hearing these things. They were having teachers that would come in and would all of a sudden tell this Gnosticism, this, this new knowledge that they had gotten. But it was different from what Paul had taught. It was different from the Scriptures. And many people were being drawn away and led to these false teachings. And so Paul, again, he's writing to help combat that. They saw divisions were starting to arise in the church. They saw grumblings, heated arguments among the brethren about doctrine, about theology. And as Paul writes in chapter 1, some had even turned away to what was perceived to be a different gospel, another way. But we know that there is no other gospel and there is no other way. No way. Okay. Only God's way is the way to salvation. Not man's way, not our own thoughts, not our own desires, but God's way, His way as He has set forth. It's grace, not grace plus works. And that's what they were fighting against. And so the church gets word to Paul. They, they send letters. They want to know, we need to know what's going on. You taught us a lot of things, but we're hearing all these other teachers that are coming in saying this. There's mumblings and grumblings going on. There's splits in churches happening. Factions are starting to grow. And, and heated debates, brother turning against brother. And so they write, they, need, they desperately need answers. So Paul writes this letter in a defense. He writes a letter to confront the heresies, not only though to confront the heresies, but also to solidify his claim as an apostle of Christ. Because so that was one of the things that the Judaizers were trying to do. They were trying to say, Paul wasn't really an apostle. He didn't walk with Jesus. He didn't see him resurrect. He was a persecutor of the church. And so he needs to, he's also writing to defend and solidify his claim as an apostle of Christ. And the point that he's trying to make is the same one that we need to grasp today. And that is this, that the message that he taught and preached, the very words that we have today in our Bibles, are the very words of the Almighty God Himself, Yahweh, who through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit breathed in and also through writers long ago, like Paul and Peter and John, Matthew, Mark, Luke. And if the word, these words are given by the Creator... We better pay attention to what he's saying and listen to what he says. Because any other religious work, any other quote-unquote religion is actually an abomination to a holy God. And it will lead to destruction to those who follow that way. 
And as true Christians, we actually we have a sacred responsibility to watch out for one another. We need to be concerned for each other, to watch out for each other, to make sure that we do not stumble, that we do not wander off the path, if you will. We have that responsibility for each other. And so if you will, open your Bibles and turn to Galatians chapter 6. We'll be looking at the first six verses, Galatians chapter 6, and then stand as you're able for the honoring of the reading of God's holy word. Galatians chapter 6, starting at verse number 1. Galatians 6, starting at verse 1, Paul writes, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work. And then we will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Let him who has taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Let's pray. Father God, as we look into your word today, we pray that your words will come alive to us. We pray that as the, these words that were penned so many thousand years ago, Lord, that they were still relevant for us today that the things that were happening then are happening now in churches throughout the world. And so, Father, we know that your word is never irrelevant, but it's true for all people of all times, of all places, always. And so, Father, we pray that these words of truth today will sink deeply into our hearts and our minds, that your word will transform our hearts and minds today, that we will set aside any preconceived notions, any opinions, and any thoughts, and we would just submit ourselves to the authority of your word. And it's in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 You can be seated. So as we look at Galatians 6 today, we're going to be looking at three responsibilities of a believer. So if you're a believer in Christ, there are three responsibilities that we have to one another. So if you're ones that take notes, we're going to start off looking at verse number 1. Look what it says. Paul says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of what? Of gentleness. Consider yourself, lest you also be tempted. So the first way is that when we see a fellow believer, a brother or sister in Christ, now this is not referring to someone outside of Christ. This is dealing with the church. This is dealing with each other, those who are believers. When a fellow believer stumbles, Whenever a fellow believer falls into compromise or falls into sin, our duty, our sacred duty as a brother or sister in Christ is not to kick that person when they're down. That's not what we're to do. So what, we're, what are we to do? We're to, to help them up. So the first sacred responsibility, the first responsibility of a believer that we have one another, if you're taking notes, is to help them up, to help each other up. I mean, who can say that they were without sin? Just by a show of hands, raise your hand if you were without sin. Notice I just stuffed my hands in my pockets. All right? So, who is without temptation? Can anyone say they are not tempted? No. I don't think anybody can. So, yes, you will stumble. Yes, you may even fall. There are times when our flesh, our desires, they, they just overpower our will and we fall. It's going to happen. But I want you to hold your place. Hold your place in Galatians chapter 6 and turn over to 1 John. We're moving forward toward Revelation, toward the end of the Bible. We come to 1 John. 1 John comes after 2 Peter. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. Amen when you're there. 1 John 1. Amen. 1 John 1, 8. Look what John writes. If we say that we have no sin, what does it say? What does he write? We deceive ourselves. And it says that the truth is not in us. He says, but if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say that we have not sinned, look what it says we do. We make God a liar, it says, and His word is not in us. So as the church, as the body of Christ, guys, we're a family. We are brothers and sisters. If you are in Christ today, if you've been born again, if you've repented of your sins, put your faith in Christ, then God has spiritually adopted you into His family, into Israel. We are all, 
We are now adopted. We are sons and daughters of the Most High King. So we're family together. We want the best for each other. In other words, I, I want to see you succeed in life. I want, to, I want to see you grow in your faith. I want to see you be bold in your witness. Whereas before he may have said, I don't know if I can share the gospel. I don't know if I can give out a track. I don't know if I can do that. I want to see you be bold in your witness. I want you to succeed in the Lord. I want to see you grow in that faith. And that's what we should want for each other. And as Paul says in Romans chapter 15, verse number 7, he says, We who are strong ought to bear the weakness of those without strength, to bear one another's burdens. It's what we're called to do. And if you see someone, if you know of a fellow believer who has fallen into temptation, or maybe a, a fellow believer has sinned, and you know about it, you're to go to your brother or sister. You're to confront them with that. Jesus, our Lord, actually gave us the model for what's called church discipline. Unfortunately, today in a lot of churches, church discipline is ignored. They don't want to do it. They don't want to overturn the apple cart. They don't want to upset people. Because if you upset people and they say, well, I'm not coming to this church anymore, you know what? They're going to take their, their tithes and offerings with them. So a lot of times church discipline just kind of steps back. I don't want to offend anybody. But it's not what we're commanded to do in Scripture. If you know of a brother or sister who is in sin, you're to go to them. Hold your place again and flip backward to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 18. Huh? I don't want you to think this is just me saying this. This is actually the Lord Jesus is speaking. He says, Matthew chapter 18. Amen when you're there. Matthew 18. Almost amen. 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 All right. Amen. All right. Looking at Matthew chapter 18, starting at verse number 15. This is dealing with the sinning brother. Listen to what Jesus himself, our Lord and Savior, says. He says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he hears you, you'll have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector." So here we see church discipline in action. If, if I know my brother's in sin against me, or I know he's in sin, I go to him, just me and him. And I, I, I try and witness to him. I try and share the gospel with him. I try and plead with him. Repent of that. Turn back to Christ. And if he won't listen to me, and then I go again another Christian brother or sister, someone within the church, and then we go two or three, and we try and speak to them. And it says so that everything will be, will be just right. In other words, there won't be anything where they say, well, they said this, but no, we have witnesses to know that everything that's said is exactly what was said. And if that person still won't listen, then what do we do? We actually bring them before the church body. And the church now prays for this person, tries to speak life into this person, trying to encourage this person to repent and turn back to Christ. And that person still does not listen, then they're to be anathema. They're actually to be kicked out of the church, if you will, and turned over in hopes that they would come to their senses. So that's the way it's supposed to go. And as Christians, this is a sacred responsibility. I want you to understand that. It's a sacred responsibility to do this, to help restore a brother or a sister. And it's one that God takes very seriously for His people, for His children. You see, God will not honor gossip. God will not honor murmurings talking about people behind their back. That doesn't help anything. We have to remember the lesson that the children of Israel had to learn when they were in the wilderness with Moses. There was a lot of mumbling and grumbling going on, and God got tired of it. And so what did He do? He opened up the ground. He swallowed up the rebellious murmurers and then closed the ground back. Can you imagine that today? You know, people are mumbling and grumbling, and all of a sudden the, the floor opens, and you see them drop below, and the ground slams back <laughs> shut. Well, it happened. It was recorded for us to know. And so, while God may not open up the ground today, but I want you to take note that I said He may not. I'm not saying He won't, because He can. He's God. He can do anything. But though He may not do that, Jesus does say in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, that every idle word men say they will give account of in the day of judgment. You'll have to give account of those words, idle words. 
And so again, we're to our first responsibility of a believer is to help our brother or sister up when they fall. We don't kick them when they're down, we help them back up. But our second responsibility, so again, you're taking notes, our second responsibility then is to hold them up. We pick them up and then we help hold them up. Look at verses 2. We're back in Galatians chapter 6, looking at verses 2 to 5. It says, You are to bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is really nothing, he deceives himself. Yes. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another, for each one shall bear his own load. So again, the first responsibility, help a brother or sister up. Responsibility number two, when you help them up, is to hold them up. To be set free from sin doesn't mean that the temptation will go away. <laughs> Just because you've repented of this sin today and turned away from it doesn't mean temptation will not still be there. And so you're to help hold them up. Once you've helped them up, you must pray fervently. You must pray often for your brother or sister. And, this, and here's the hard part. This is the hard part about that. You actually must invest in their life. You have to do that. What do I mean by that? You have to spend time with them. You have to bear their burdens. How often do we say, I'm going to pray for you about that. And then you walk away, but you don't check on them. You don't talk to them about it. You don't, you don't invest in their life. Because that's really the hard part. I, want, I don't want to get dirty. I don't want to get my hands in, in there. It's going to take time. I don't have a lot of time. But we're called to do that. We're called to do that. We have to invest in their life. Spend time with them. Bear their burdens. And that word for bear is bastazo. And that word conveys the idea of endurance. That's what it means. That you endure it. You sustain the burden. It takes a deep commitment. It takes self-sacrifice. And you know what it takes? It takes agape. You remember our study in the word love, agape. It takes a self-sacrificing love that even though you may not reciprocate, even though you might not show me love back or even appreciation, you might not even say thank you. I still love you. Amen. And I still keep yes. pouring into you. And I still keep investing myself in you because it's what I'm called to do by Christ. Sadly, one of the main reasons many Christians don't bother to reach out and help or get involved in other believers' lives and struggles is inwardly, down deep inside, where we would never ever actually admit it to anyone, maybe it's because actually that makes us kind of feel a little superior to sinners. Or, and wrongly consider, as the text says, that we are actually spiritually something, when in truth we're really nothing. In other words, secretly the desire is not to help a stumbling brother or sister, but it's actually to, to sit back and judge and condemn Saying to ourselves, you know what? He got himself into this mess. Let him get himself out of it. Hmm. God forgive us if we think that way towards yeah. somebody. As a believer, we're to examine ourselves. <laughs> we're to examine our motives to be sure that our own attitude and life are right in the eyes of God who sees all. So in other words, the things that I think, the things that I do, I should always say, God, are you happy with what I'm doing? Is this... Does this meet your approval, Lord? Am I, am I doing the right thing? And I look at a, a struggling brother or sister and I say, well, that's his deal. That's his, it's his fault. He shouldn't have done that or she shouldn't have done that. Got herself into that situation. She's going to have to get herself out of it. You think God's going to be pleased with that kind of an attitude? Did God say that to us in our sins? That while we were still enemies, Christ died for us? Psalm 94, 9 says this, says, he who planted the ear shall he not hear. He who, he who formed the eye shall he not see. God hears what you hear. He sees what you see. He not only sees what you do, but he sees the motive behind what you do. How frightening is that? That even our best deed could be because maybe we want the praise for it. I'm going to do this good thing so that somebody will pat me on the back and say, hey, make a big deal out of me, when we should reflect all the glory back to God instead. God does not compare believers to each other. In other words, on the day of judgment, he won't say, all right, I'm going to compare you with you. And, oh, wow, you did a lot better than he did. Or he did a lot better than you did. It's not how it's going to work. You see, the comparison is actually you and God himself. So if you want a comparison on how you're doing, compare yourself to God Almighty. And then you'll see, oh, I actually fall way short of that standard. And see... We must bear our own load. As 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, 
the body of Christ, according to what you have done, whether good or bad. We're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, it's not the judgment of you're in sin and now you're going to go to hell because you've not repented. No, no. If you've repented and been born again, you don't have to worry about that. You've been saved from that. But the Bible says, again, 2 Corinthians, we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We will give an account of our lives, give an account of the seed that God has given us. Have we gone out? Have we sown? Have we invested? Have we done? What have we done in His name? We will all be judged according to that, according to the Scriptures whether good or bad. So to love and to care for and to minister and to lift up, it's not just a pastor's job. It's not just my job. It's our job. As the body of Christ, we are to love each other, to care for each other. John 13, 34 to 35, Jesus commands us, He says, you shall love one another. You shall, in other words, you shall, but the word He uses is you shall agapeo one another, the verb tense. Love sacrificially one another. He goes on to continue, as he has loved you, that you also love one another. And it's by this love, the way you care for each other, and you invest in each other's lives, and you show that you, you do care and you love them. He says, by this all will know that you are my disciples. If, and underline that if in your Bible, you love one another. That's how people will know. And here's the other side of the coin, though. Here's that other side. If you're the one who has been delivered from a sin, maybe you're the one that was in sin, you're the one that was tempted, and your brother or sister has helped you up, and is helping to hold you up. This is the other edge of the coin. You actually have an obligation to let your Christian brothers or sisters carry your burdens for you. You have an obligation to let them do that. It's not a super spirituality that makes you want to go it alone. You know, to say... I got this. I appreciate the help. I appreciate the sentiment. But no, I got this. It's not super spirituality. That's called pride. It's mm. called pride. Pride will make you say, no thanks. I don't need your help. I can do it alone. Pride is sin, and it's also an abomination to God. James 4, 6 goes so far as to say God will actually resist the proud, but he will give grace to the humble. I don't know about you, but I want God to resist me. Mm -hmm. James also tells us in James 5.16 that we are to confess your sins to one another. That we are to pray for one another, he says, so that you may be healed. And he goes on to say, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. God himself, though, is our ultimate source of strength. We're called to cast our burdens upon him, but he will use fellow believers, brothers and sisters, to help carry the burdens of his children. Even the Apostle Paul was attacked with temptation and discouragement. Can we believe that? The one who wrote over half, more than half, of the New Testament, Apostle Paul, was attacked with temptation, with discouragement. Even he needed help. So again, hold your place and turn to 2 Corinthians. It's actually one book back, one letter back from Galatians. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, starting at verse number 5. So 2 amen. Corinthians chapter 7, amen, you're there. Chapter 5, verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, starting at verse 5, amen. 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 Now, I want you to think as we read this, this is Paul, writer almost of all the New Testament, super spiritual guy. Look what he says. He says, for indeed, when we came to Macedonia, he said, our bodies had no rest. We were troubled on every side. Outside of the body were conflicts, but inside were fears. But nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by what? By the coming of Titus. He says, and not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you. He's talking to the church in, in Corinth. When he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, and your zeal for me. So I rejoiced even more. Do you see what Paul's saying? He's saying, on the outside, there were all these conflicts that were going outside the body. All around me, there were conflicts. And inside were fears, were doubts, were struggles. And he was downcast. He said, but then all of, a, all of a sudden, God sent Titus. You can imagine. I mean, we can't fathom what it was like back in Paul's day. We can't fathom that. 
Christianity was illegal. In some places, it was persecuted to the point of death. And so Paul's by himself, and he says, you know, here we are, me and the other brothers from Macedonia, all this stuff's going on. We can barely take it. We're about to the point, we're about to break. And then all of a sudden, here comes Titus. Then he tells us, I've been praying for you, Paul. It's good to see you, brother. And Paul now has a fellow brother or sister that he can, he can pour out to. Because he's a man, he was a man like we're human, he's human like we are. Same things. And so, not only he said that just seeing Titus helped brighten his day to know that somebody cared, but also, when Titus came, he said, I also was comforted by knowing that you as the church were praying for me. <laughs> He's saying, I rejoiced when I heard that, to know that people were praying for him. So we should do the same. <laughs> so we're to help one another up. That's the first thing. When we fall, we're to hold one another up a second. But lastly, we're to build one another up. Looking back at Galatians 6, verse 6. Paul wrote, Let him who was taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. The Greek in which Paul's letter was written actually can be translated better to say this. Let him who receives instruction share with him who gives instruction in all the good things. The word for share is koinonio, which has the idea of sharing equally. We share equally with each other. And it's actually the verb form of koinonia. You may have heard that word before. It means fellowship. When we come together, we come together for koinonia. <coughs> that time where we have, when we come in, we greet, we hug, we love, it's called koinonia. It's a fellowship with each other. And Paul is saying the one that teaches and the one who is taught, they have a common fellowship and they should share in all good things together. When you picked up a fallen brother. When you held up that person, and then you build them up. But how do you build them up? You build them up in the Word of God, which you both share in common. We share this same book in common. My, my book is no different than yours. Maybe more marks in it and little sticky notes on the side, but it's the same words of God. We all have that same book. And so we share in all the good things within, and then we help build that person up. As we talked back at the beginning of the Advent season, there's hope, faith, joy, and peace. And that hope, joy, faith, and peace with which we build them up can only come from the Word of God. It can only come from the Word of God. Ministry is a Christian's responsibility. It's not just a pastor's responsibility. Because what's going to happen, and it will happen, when persecution floods America, and we can see it happening now where Christianity is going to become an outlaw religion again. Mm -hmm. And the church, as we see it now, those doors will be chained and locked by the government. You will not be allowed to come together to worship this way. China's going through it now. The Middle East is going through it now. Why are we any different? We can expect it to happen. So when it expects to happen, this will be your sword. This will be your guide. You won't be able to come together and have a pastor stand up in front of you and open up the Word of God and teach you from the Word of God. You have the Holy Spirit that will do that for you. And you have that same Holy Spirit now. And so we're to build each other up. We're to minister to each other and meet each other and greet each other. If you see somebody that looks a little down, don't ignore that. You don't know what's going on in their life, just like we don't know what's going on in each other's lives. Only God is privy to that. But you won't know if you don't ask. And if someone asks, don't be prideful and say, I'm fine, I'm good. When, in, when inside your heart's breaking, or you're just burdened down and you can't take it anymore. Don't let pride well up. You see, we're to love each other and to care for each other. We're, we're to pick each other up, hold each other up, and then build each other up. And you can't do that by yourself. So ministry is not a burden, it's a blessing. It's a blessing to pray for each other. It's a blessing to be able to speak to each other and, and talk through the Scriptures and the Word with each other. It's an honor to be able to pour into someone's life. And you know what else it is? It's an investment into eternity. What did Jesus say? Don't, don't worry about money and clothing. Don't worry about the things where the moth will destroy and rust will destroy and thieves will break in and steal. But where did He say to lay up your treasures? In, in heaven. heaven. And that's what you do when you invest in other people. You're investing in eternity. You're investing in things that will last. I want to close with Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians comes right after Galatians. So if you're in Galatians, turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. Amen. You're there. 
We'll be starting at verse number 1. Ephesians chapter 4. Amen. Amen. This is about walking in unity. Starting at Ephesians 4, going through the first 16 verses. Listen to what Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. He says, I therefore... The prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. He says, There is one body, there is one Spirit, and just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he left captivity captive and gave gifts to men. And now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended in the lower parts of the earth. He also who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And for what purpose, church? Look what verse 12 says. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ until we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children who are tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into Him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effect of working, and again, this is the part to underline, by which every part does its share. And look what it says it causes. It causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So you want to grow the church. You want to go to the body of Christ. Look what Paul says has to be done. Every part does its share. God has given a gift to each and every believer that's here. A spiritual gift. Some more than one gift. Pray about what God has given you and how you can use that to further His kingdom. So as verse 6 told us of Galatians and also Ephesians chapter 4 teaches us, as your pastor, my job ultimately is to equip you. You are the saints of God. You are a saint. You can start addressing each other that way. Same Roy, how are you? Same Betty, good to see you. You can do that because the Bible calls you that. If you're in Christ, you're a saint. You're a saint of God. Saint Summer. Yeah. Well, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> but again, my job is to equip you for the work of ministry, to minister to each other, to love one another. And friends, we have the honor of sharing and walking this walk together with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to close with this exhortation from James chapter 5. In verse 19 and 20, he says, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and if someone turns him back, let him know this, that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death, and will cover a multitude of sins. And we know from God's Word, what is it that covers a multitude of sins? Love. Love. Yeah. Love. 1 Peter 4 8. Love will cover a multitude of sins. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your love today. Father, when you saved us, you gave us a down payment on eternity by cleansing us from our sins, but also by making our bodies your tabernacle, the dwelling place for your spirit. Father, you beckon us to come to your table, to sit with many brothers and sisters in eternity. Father, we thank You for that. Father, we thank You that we have Your Word, that it teaches us, it instructs, it instructs us, it exhorts us. Help us to be in Your Word every day, to take the bread of life every day. Help us to never go hungry or starve from Your Word, Lord, but yet we feed on Your Word every day. For it's that bread that came down from heaven. And we thank you for that. 
Help us that if we see our brother or sister stumbling or falling into sin, that we not well up with pride and try and be above them thinking that we're better than them. And help us, Lord, to be humble of heart. Give us a heart to care, to see. Open our eyes to those that are hurting around us. And help us to pick them up, to hold them up, and then to build them up in your word. And we know, Father, that is your will for our lives as believers. Help us to not be sidelined Christians. There are no Christians that sit on the bench, Lord, but we're going to be in this together. And so, Father, we thank you that we do have the church, the body of Christ. We thank you for the freedoms that we have together, be able to come together and lift each other up before you. And so we praise you today, we thank you today, and we love you, Father. And it's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.